Okay, we're in the book of Jeremiah. If you wandered in the wrong place, Revelation's across the plaza. Last time, we finished chapter 23, is that correct? And we are in chapter 24. I'm going to sort of hustle through because I'm anxious to get to chapter 25. We've got some wild material in chapter 25. Okay, Jeremiah, chapter 24, verse 1. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. Well, first of all, Nebuchadnezzar, which your Bible probably has, is actually probably the more accurate pronunciation, but we're also used to the Nebuchadnezzar, which the Hebraized transliteration leads us to. So I won't try to correct that, although if you're going to pick between the two, the Nebuchadrezzar is actually the, perhaps, scholars believe, maybe the more closely to the uh, Chaldean pronunciation. But in any case, same guy. We'll talk a lot. We have talked a lot about him, and we'll talk some more about him uh, before the evening's over. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, uh, these two baskets of figs, it's going to be a strange idiom because there's going to be good ones and bad ones. And what's really interesting are the good ones are the ones that go into captivity. The bad ones are the ones that don't. That sounds backwards until you really understand what the Lord is trying to communicate to these people through Jeremiah. Verse 2, one basket had very good figs, even like the figs that were first ripe. The other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, what seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, the good figs, very good, and the bad, very bad, that cannot be eaten because they are so bad. Okay, sort of straightforward for King James English, right? I'd like to figure out how to add something to that, but I don't think I can. They're pretty straightforward. <laughs> Verse 4, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive of Judah whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and, they, and not pluck them up. And I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Now, he's really looking ahead for that, by the way, because there's a lot of intervening history. But um, were they, what, was he their God, that is the people he's talking to? No, that's the whole problem, is that they were worshiping idols. He wasn't their God. He wanted to be. And uh, they were all worshiping idols, and that's exactly what Jeremiah has been setting forth all the way through. But the day will come when he brings them back from the captivity, that they will, in fact, uh, worship him and with their whole heart. Now, verse 8, And like the bad figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so bad. Surely, thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb a taunt and a curse in all places to which I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and their fathers. Strange idiom here. Basically, the idea is this is just another way of amplifying what um, Jeremiah has been telling them, is that Nebuchadnezzar, is God's servant. We're going to talk a lot about that more in chapter 25. But the enemies of Israel have been raised by God to be their instrument of judgment. And what Jeremiah is telling them to either repent or submit. In other words, not to fight Nebu uh, uh, Babylon. Now, of course, Zedekiah and his princes were pro-Egyptian, the contrary power, and um, uh, kept having intrigues to their own detriment. But Jeremiah is saying, no, the Babylonians are going to succeed. You're wasting your time with these other petty alliances that Nebuchadnezzar is going to succeed. 
And it's an interesting idiom. The good figs are those who get taken into captivity. Why? Because even though they're slaves in Babylon, they will return to the land. And they are also, by submitting to Babylon, in effect, submitting to that instrument which God has raised. Very strange message. And, of course, the bad figs are the ones that resist. Now, that's sort of backwards. You'd sort of think, gee, the patriots and zealots are fighting the invaders. No, they're not. They're recognizing uh, God's message to them, which is that the Babylonians are God's instrument for their, for their uh, judgment. Now, we're going to find that this, this uh, theme of Jeremiah gets extremely unpopular. We're going to discover in chapter 26 uh, that he gets actually tried for heresy. He gets put on trial. And uh, chapter 26 is actually an amplification of the temple address that we took in chapter 7. Remember, I warned you that these aren't in chronological order. And, of course, I'm getting ahead of the game. But the point is, Nebuchadnezzar is God's servant. Jeremiah is God's messenger and trying to get this across. Now, a couple of other interesting things. Um, Strangely enough, in the Gospels, if you watch carefully, Jesus talks about a fig tree in a vineyard. And you just read in Mark or wherever it is, you read that, you sort of pass through it because you get onto the, the point of his parable. But it's kind of interesting. What is the fig tree? Judah. What's the vineyard? Israel, in the collective sense. And it's interesting that those idioms have some consistency here. Now, what makes this also interesting is the figs ripen in June. Now, I realize that fact. You may wonder, that's interesting. What do I do with that piece of information? Store it away, because we're going to talk about the Six-Day War in a few chapters and how that all fits together. So just a little little comment there that figs ripen in June. I thought you would enjoy that. You mystics among us, you you advanced students of prophecy will say, aha, another one of Missler's nonsense. No, another um, in, perhaps insight. I should also point out that the exiles that were taken into captivity in Babylon, the good figs here, strangely enough, they prospered in Babylon. Yes, they were slaves, and yes, they were deported, but they really don't too badly. In 2 Kings 25, and chapters 27 through 30, and 2 Kings 25 deals with this, and we're also going to come across it in Jeremiah 29, uh, that, that idea that they, even though they're in exile, so that they, they prosper. In fact, they prosper so well that when they finally get freed to go back to the homeland, when after Cyrus the Persian issues his decree, You all know the story how Cyrus conquered Babylon and uh, uh, and he gets uh, presented this letter written to him by name, written 150 years earlier, which we call Isaiah 44 and 45. Uh, Cyrus is impressed because he's called by by name there. Because I'm calling you by name, surnaming you, even though you've not known me, you'll know that I'm the God of Israel. And Cyrus is so impressed with this that he provides for their release. What's interesting is we talk under Ezra and Nehemiah. They regather in the land, right? And they rebuild the wall and all this stuff, right? Interesting issue because there's only 37,000 of them. When you read the scripture carefully, you'll discover the remnant that returned to the land to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple and all of that. And we'll talk more about that too, of course, shortly. It's not a big number. As I remember, I'm doing this from memory, but I think it's something like 37,000 some odd that go back, which ain't a bunch. What does that mean? That they prosper the rest, profit. When they're free, they didn't want to leave. They, you know, they're comfortable. They, they dropped their root there. They hadn't gone back to the land. So that's kind of provocative. Okay, we could, uh, we could prattle more on this. Uh, this business of them being removed and so forth. We've been in Deuteronomy 28 and all of that, uh, which can be... You can look at this as being fulfilled in the fall of Jerusalem under Nebuchadnezzar. You can also see this as the fall of Jerusalem under Titus Vespasian. We've talked about that before. And I don't think we need to press that anymore. We've been over that material. Now we get to chapter 25. Chapter 25 actually is earlier in time. Uh, From the point of view of Jeremiah, to really confuse you, it actually occurs between chapters 35 and 36, but that's because the whole book is is a strange compilation of messages, so they're not obviously in chronological order. But chapter 25, very important chapter. As I've mentioned before, but just to remind you one more time, there's a very, very important battle in ancient history called the Battle of Karshemesh. That's where... This young general by the name of Nebuchadnezzar uh, defeats Pharaoh Necho at the Euphrates, and it's one of the most decisive battles in the history of the world. It alters the whole future of of West Asia. Now, that's very important for us because that sets the the rise of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, during during a a subsequent siege of Jerusalem that his father dies, Nebuchadnezzar dies, and Nebuchadnezzar, this uh, successful general, becomes the king of Babylon. Young guy. 
And, of course, he distrusts his advisors of his now-deceased father, and that's what gives rise to this peculiar test. When he, le he, he levels, I mean, he doesn't level, he just, he just uh, takes charge of Jerusalem, sets up a vassal king, takes Daniel and the young promising uh, young men as uh, slaves for the court of Babylon, puts them through postgraduate school, but then uses the opportunity in Daniel chapter 2 to test these old advisors of his father to see if they really knew what they were doing. And that gives rise to that whole Daniel 2 episode and the image and all of that. But young man, very bright guy, does some very progressive things. Very interesting, interesting man. Uh, very worth your study. The other reason, though, that this is so important is this event launches a period of time which in Luke is called the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles span the time from Nebuchadnezzar's rise as a king of Babylon through the rise of another world leader who is probably alive today that will appear on the scene. You and I will probably not see his rise. We'll watch it from the mezzanine. Daniel, there's two chapters in the Bible, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel 7, which chronicle specifically the Gentile history. Most of the Bible, you know, deals with the history of Israel. God's dealing with Israel and the land and all of that. There are a couple of exceptions, the two most prominent ones being Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, which deals with the, specifically the times of the Gentiles. Daniel chapter 2 is a vision that Nebuchadnezzar has in a dream one night that he ultimately calls upon Daniel to interpret. And that's the vision of all Gentile dominion from Nebuchadnezzar to the Antichrist in terms as man sees it, bright, shiny metals. Later on in Daniel's career, he's standing by the river, and he sees the night visions, and these strange creatures come out of the river in Daniel chapter 7, and he sees the same series of empires, but as God sees them, as voracious beasts preying upon one another. But both of them are a chronicle of the times of the Gentiles, a time that's very critical to understand if you're going to grasp the Bible uh, collectively and individually. Secondly, it's also of great interest to you and I because, A, we're Gentiles, and, B, we're living at the conclusion of that spectacular set of prophecies. And so the Battle of Karshemesh, the rise of Nebuchadnezzar, very, very important, and we're going to see in chapter 25 uh, even more so. Now, in the first verse of chapter 25, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning the people of Judah... In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, and it goes on. Now, this is very, very precisely dated. The first year of Nebuchadnezzar. You'll find this here, chapter 36, first verse, chapter 45, first verse, chapter 46, second verse. For rough purposes, we're going to talk about chronology later. But to give you a it's roughly 605 B.C., first year of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you may compare this with Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, and perceive a slight discrepancy. That's because there's two ways of reckoning a year when a king exceeds to the throne. There's the accession year or the non-accession year. Judah did it one way, Babylonian, Babylon did it another way. The two actually agree, although it may not look like it at first. And uh, if you, the minute you get into these chronological issues, it gets complicated. And, but uh, some of that complication is worth wading through because of some interesting surprises in store for us as we, we tackle some of those issues. First year of Nebuchadnezzar. This is the first invasion of Nebuchadnezzar. This is chronicled in 2 Kings chapter 24, for those of you that wanna, may want to do some background reading. The first siege of Nebuchadnezzar. This starts a period called the servitude of the nation. And we're going to see that in this chapter, in verse uh, 9 and 10 and 11, the duration of that servitude is prophesied. The servitude of the nation is prophesied to be 70 years. We'll come to that, but just to give you, I'm trying to give you the overview. And that goes from Nebuchadnezzar through Cyrus when he conquers Babylon and lets them go. He lets them go home and build their temple. Not the wall of the city, the temple. There's another period also prophesied to be 70 years called the Desolations of Jerusalem. And most of you who may study, see and study Bibles will treat those as synonyms. They're not. The servitude of the nation starts at the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar when the nation ceases to be free and, in fact, is a vassal of Babylon. 
Some years later, they rebel. Nebuchadnezzar puts that down, puts up Zedekiah and takes the other guys captive. And, all, and, and, and Ezekiel gets deported in the second siege. Some years later, they once again rebel, Zedekiah and his gang. And Nebuchadnezzar has a belly full of it. And he set, lets siege a third time. But this time levels the place and takes them all. And Jerusalem ceases to exist. And that's the beginning of the desolations of Jerusalem. It's also prophesied to be 70 years. Now, what's interesting is that when Cyrus gives the commandment to release the exiles, the slaves, to go back home and rebuild their temple and allow them freedom to, to worship and so forth, they do. They have a meager beginning. They have all their troubles under Ezra, as you probably may recall. And it's a guy by the name of Nehemiah who is a cupbearer to king, Artaxerxes Longimanus, some substantial period after Cyrus, who's troubled because the Jews are back in their land, but they're, they're harassed. They have no sovereignty. And he prevails upon Artaxerxes Longimanus, who issues a decree to give them the authority to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. That's different than the temple. And many of your study Bibles, when you get into this, you'll notice there's all these different decrees. Most of them say there's three different decrees. There's actually four, but three of them have to do with the temple. Only one has to do with the wall. That's what the book of Nehemiah is all about, to go back and rebuild the wall and reestablish the city of Jerusalem. And it turns out, we won't take too much time here, but the desolations of Jerusalem... Um, which are mentioned in Ezekiel 24, 2 Kings 25, and we're going to run into it again in Jeremiah 52. They, start, they, uh, they started uh, in the uh, ninth year of Nebuchadnezzar, 10th month, 10th day of the month of Tabeth. The desolations end on the uh, 24th of Cheslev in the ninth month of the second year of Darius or of the Mede. But anyway, the negative is when you go through that arithmetic, it turns out to be 25,200 days or 70 years if you use 360-day years to the day. So both periods of time are fulfilled precisely. And we're going to make a big thing of that later. But don't confuse the servitude of the nation and the desolations of the Jerusalem. They overlap, but they are actually, surprisingly enough, apparently distinct in prophecy and also yet both literally fulfilled. Um, so this chapter is going to deal with some of that. Uh, we're going to primarily focus tonight on the servitude of the nation, the Nebuchadnezzar uh, first siege thing here. Now, incidentally, where Jeremiah the prophet spoke unto all the people, first occurrence of that particular phrase, what Jeremiah is going to do, he's going to review 23 years of faithful ministry. He's about mid, mid-career point here. He has served 19 years under Josiah the king, the one that got killed at Megiddo, and four years under Jehoiakim. Bear in mind, Jehoiakim. Jehoiahaz and, and Jehoiachin both were three-month kind of tenures. They don't amount to a lot in that sense. Concurrent prophets with Jeremiah include Uriah, which we'll talk about later, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. So he wasn't alone. There were other prophets at the time. And I'm ignoring for the moment Daniel and, and, Daniel and Ezekiel, who are in Babylon, not in Jerusalem, or not in, the, in, the, in Judea at the time. They're, they're slaves, and uh, ultimately they end up in, in um, Babylon. Jeremiah. 23 years of faithful ministry. What a miserable ministry to have. To have to try to get your nation to repent, knowing they won't, and to preside over their demise. Interesting, interesting situation. Whenever I think of that, I have to share with you an unrelated, but maybe not unrelated, anecdotal issue. Uh, I think some of you who know me, have heard some of my previous tapes, know that uh, I was... As a teen, came to the Lord as a teenager and grew up well trained biblically. I happened to fall under some very sound teaching of some very good expositionally oriented Bible specialist teachers that gave me some valuable instruction during my pre college years and uh, high school years. Um, in fact, I accompanied a very prominent lecturer on his tour and got a chance to ask him a lot of questions, and it was, it was a wonderful learning experience. Then I went to the Naval Academy and got into my executive career and drifted from play. We, my wife and I have lived in 22 homes in our 30 years of marriage, so you can get some idea that we, we, we moved around a little bit. Uh, 
But as we did, as we moved from place to place, I didn't understand why it was that we never felt home in a, in, in a, in a, in a church home. We were in Methodist, Presbyterians, you name it, all the different denominational places as we'd move from place to place trying to find a church. We're not sophisticated in understanding why it was we never were comfortable. Looking back, as I learned and grew spiritually, I, pre- I began to realize more and more that our problem was we took the Bible literally, and most ministers didn't. And we were, to some extent, in my opinion, victimized by what I like to just, what I'll call, for lack of a better word, call denominationalism. Victims of a liberal theology, victims of, of churches whose focus are on programs and structure and everything but the Lord Jesus Christ and everything but a sincere, unadulterated presentation of the Word of God. Things you and I here in this context take for granted, but especially in that era, it was something that was the exception rather than the rule and certainly something you rarely found within the, the formal denominational structures. So anyway, for, for, for 18 years from roughly my college entrance from, say, 50 through to about 1970. Uh, I, uh, as I put that in spiritual perspective, was on the penalty box or in the bench or something. I didn't backslide. I didn't have the ima- imagination to undertake gross sins. I don't have very dramatic, you know, testimony about drugs or fleeing jail or any of those kind of colorful things. I was just useless. You know, you know what an inoculation is? That's an imbuing of a, you know, a mild case of it to make you immune to the real thing. Well, that's exactly what was happening to me. Now, obviously, in the late 60s, we had things like the Six-Day War and other things. And I'll target about 1970, we, the Lord just really woke us up, made us very sensitive to the time we're living. All those things that I had learned as a teenager were happening. Israel was back in the land since May 1448, of course. But more importantly, Jerusalem was under the Star of David for the first time since Christ's words the week he was crucified, that Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times the Gentiles are fulfilled. So we're obviously entering into a very important era, and so on. So that, you know, that woke us up, and I got close to a number of the people that, were, that you all know, Hal Lindsey, Walter Martin, and Chuck Smith, and people that were very articulate spokesmen for what, what really is a very independent viewpoint of, of what the Bible is really all about. Well, I developed, as I, as I woke up to the reality of my fundamental expositional background, and uh, I, I have to be confess with you, I, had, I, I started to harbor a lot of hostility towards the denominational background that had disenfranchised me for 18 years. Now, that's, I'm not only non-denominational, if I'm really honest, I'm anti-denominational, which is probably, you know, not too constructive. But anyway, I was talking to Walter Martin one time about that. I was sort of mouthing off about how... For eight, how denominationalism had stolen 18 years of my life. And he says, Chuck, that's okay, in his majestic style, point out, that's okay, Chuck, those are the years that the locusts have eaten. <laughs> and I looked Walter in the eye, and I says, that's great, Walter, what do I do with that piece of information? <laughs> he says, well, Chuck, he promises to give you those back. And I shrugged that off, saying, sure, you know, after the millennium or something, I mean, in the, after the rapture or something. He says, no, 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 in your life, he will give you those years back. And uh, he admonished me to claim that as a, as a prophecy that he was giving me, that uh, those years would be returned to me. Well, I happened to be reminded of that recently, not only because we went through Joel not too long ago, but I was also intrigued because from 19, if I get the 18 years I lost, you know, that means I've got till 1988. Okay, so I've got to hurry through the major prophets in the Torah. Um, <laughs> Now, it doesn't mean the rapture's coming in 1988. I, I, you know, I may just get hit by a car or something. But the point is, uh, the point is, is that it's going to be interesting to see if he's counting, you know. Uh, but I, I share that with you. I, I don't think Jeremiah had those particular thoughts as he was looking at his 23 years of faithful ministry because he's about mid-career. He's got, he's got some mileage left in that, that man. But I'm always thinking about that, is that I praise God for the privilege of having been associated with you and having the opportunity here through... Uh, the ministry of this unique organization here and also through the uh, the uh, channels that have been opened up by the tape ministries that are just awesome. And I just praise God that he's given me that chance to, to repair the damage, to repair the, uh, the, the many years that I was uh, fruitless on his behalf. We got down to verse 2, verse 3. From the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, uh, the king of Judah, even unto this day, that is... The three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord came unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. Twenty-three years of apparent, no apparent fruit. Can you imagine that? Verse 4. 
And the Lord said, uh, hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, but inclined your ear to hear. That's the reference. Now, you should always recognize that these prophets are not necessarily alone. We often think of Isaiah in the reign of Hezekiah. Well, great, but so is Micah and Amos and others. So there's often multiple po- prophets. And don't assume that they don't talk to one another. You know, they're, they're servants of the Lord. But anyway, and we're going to talk more about some of those couple, in another chapter when Jeremiah is de- being defended, if you will, from, from his, in his trial, in his inquisition. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Verse 5. Now, these, are, these other prophets said, they said, turn again now, every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no harm. See, all this judgment is conditioned upon their lack of repentance, if I can put it that way. In other words, the, the promise of... Uh, um, a foregoing of all of this is always there if they'll repent. And, uh, of course, they don't. Verse 7. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands uh, to your own harm. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and perpetual desolations. Now, we're going to go on here, but before we... let's. Uh, Three times in the book of Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar is listed as the Lord's servant. That's strange. Here's this pagan, idol-worshipping ruler called the Lord's servant. It's here in chapter 25, chapter 27, chapter 43. You'll find those phrases. Cyrus, by the way, the Persian who, who later comes on the scene, is also twice in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45, referred to as the Lord's anointed. Now, those are strange expressions of a Gentile king. So Cyrus also has this peculiar designation. But Nebuchadnezzar is spoken of by the Lord as his servant. What that tells you is the Lord is capable of using tainted vessels. That's why I'm here. One of the things you probably may not recall is there is a chapter of your Bible that was not only written by Nebuchadnezzar. Do you know that? Did you know that Nebuchadnezzar wrote a chapter in your Bible? Not only that, he wrote it in the form of a memo that was put on every telegraph pole around the known world. Um, When you read Daniel chapter 4, you're in for a surprise. If you haven't ever caught that, it opens and closes. It is I, Nebuchadnezzar, and he tells the story on himself, how through his pride... God subjects him to seven years of mental derangement. And he forecasts that he would, and Nebuchadnezzar in his braggadocio invokes that prophecy on himself and and, 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 uh, uh, endures a mental derangement for seven years, at the end of which he returns to his faculties, regains the throne, and as a result of that whole experience, announces that the God of Daniel is indeed the God of the universe. And when you read the close of that letter, you can understand why I am one of those crackpots or screwballs or whatever that believes Nebuchadnezzar was saved. Now, I can't prove that, but it sure sounds like it when I read the way he finishes Daniel chapter 4. Now, during those seven years, there's a tradition. There's no biblical evidence, but there's a tradition that uh, he was under the personal care of Daniel. And as you really study the book of Daniel, you discover that... uh, that Daniel has a deep affection and respect for King Nebuchadnezzar. And even later, when he's brought out of retirement to interpret this peculiar handwriting on the wall, he doesn't get into that before he puts down this grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, saying, now, your your granddad, now, there was a king. Not you, jerk. He really lets him have it. (laughs) Which is, you know, kind of a gutsy. Daniel always was kind of a gutsy guy. But um, uh, anyway, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, interesting guy, worth your study. Probably the most absolute despot that has ever been on the planet Earth. And uh, he didn't mess around. 
very, very strong guy. And, uh, but he is one that God raises to judge Israel. Now, why am we beating this up so hard? Why are we getting into all this? Well, first of all, this in, gets all entangled through, uh, throughout the Scripture. There are several major milestones in Israel's history. Obviously, the time of the patriarchs of Abra Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we're all familiar with that from Genesis. And there's all, obviously get into the era of the monarchy with Saul and David and Solomon and all of that. But one of the major pivotal facts of Israel's history is the 70 years Babylonian captivity. So just as your grasp of the overview of Israel's history, that's really important. And uh, they obviously return after Babylon, but uh, then came the Medes and the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and of course the time of Christ. So you get an, a feeling for the history. But there's some other reasons that this 70-year captivity is so important. It launches, as I say, the period of the times of the Gentiles, which we will be emphasizing. But there's some other issues that are really worth understanding. And that comes down now to verse 10 and 11. Moreover, verse 10, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, and the sound of millstones, and the light of the lamp. Very poetic language for judgment. If that sounds familiar to you, the reason it does is it's quoted in Revelation chapter 18, verse 13. And that's a, uh, in, one of the, in chapters 17 and 18 of the book of Revelation, John, the writer, deals with an idiom called Mystery Babylon. We're going to talk more about that also. We're going to discover that Babylon, literal Babylon, is prophesied to be doomed and never again rebuilt. So that gives us all kinds of puzzlement when we get to the book of Revelation. Now, there are some scholars that quarrel with the language in the translation, argue that these prophecies that we're, we'll come to, that prophesy that Babylon will never be rebuilt and so forth, actually doesn't mean literally just for a long time. And that there's, the language could allow for that if you understand the technicalities of the Hebrew. But uh, what seems to be more a consistent uh, uh, frame of thought is that Babylon is, in fact, prophesied not to be put to, after Nebuchadnezzar. They're ultimately going to be destroyed never again to be rebuilt or inhabited. And we'll examine those prophecies shortly. Now, why do I make a point of that? Because when you get to the book of Revelation, and Revelation deals with mystery Babylon, the writer there is dealing with Babylon idiomatically. And for you to understand what Revelation is really talking about, you need to understand Babylon. So what we do when we get through the book of Revelation, we spend a lot of time understanding Babylon spiritually and the roots, and it's the role of Babylon in the history of Israel, which does not start here in Jeremiah. It starts in Genesis, the first uh, uh, empire under Nimrod, the hunter, and the Tower of Babel, and, and that whole bit. And I won't obviously di you know, divert this whole study as a recap of all of that, but be aware of the fact that the book of Revelation makes a big thing of Babylon. And it's interesting that in the middle of chapter 17 and 18, which deals with mystery Babylon, chapter 18, verse 23 you'll find this verse essentially quoted in the book of Revelation. And uh, those of you that are interested in the book of Revelation or want to get, you can refresh on that or dig into the tapes if you like. We won't take the time here other than just calling your attention to that. It's the next verse that I want to call your attention to. And this whole land, what land is he talking about? Israel. This whole land shall be a desolation and a horror, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon... 70 years. This is one of several places where this phrase is going to occur. It'll occur in verse 12 too. In fact, verse 12, let's just read the verse. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, says the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. That's one of the several prophecies that says that when this is over, Babylon's had it. Okay. Now, if you want a test of the fulfillment of prophecy, ask yourself, how many Babylonians have you met? It ain't there. And that's interesting. But there's some other lessons here that I'd like to focus on. Um, and that's this 70 years thing. And for this, this is important enough. In general, I just throw out the references and let you dig on yourself. But in this case, I think what I'd like to do is, uh, in fact, uh, 
take you back, and this is so important that let's review some background. Turn to Leviticus 25. Leviticus, of course, has a detailed, all kinds of detailed ordinances and laws, and it's just a, it's sometimes a tough reading, and yet it's just rich with insights. Turn to Leviticus 25, and I'll, um, uh, Moses uh, is at Mount Sinai, and they're saying in verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. That can be a strange idea for you. We all think of the Sabbath day. What we mean by that is the Sabbath for man. The Sabbath for man. That's six days you work, the seventh you honor is the Sabbath day. That's not the only Sabbath. There's also a Sabbath for the land. The whole history of Israel, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, is all tied up with the land in a very mystical, special way. You cannot really talk much about the relationship of God and Israel with, without getting entangled with the real estate, the title deed, the generations and the genealogies which deal with the land conveyance. The land is an integral part of your perception about God's relationship with Israel. But here he says there's a Sabbath. Um, uh, the, the, shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord? Six years shalt thou sow thy field. Six years shalt thou prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall, this shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard, and that which groweth out of its own accord of thy harvest shalt thou not reap, neither uh, gather the grapes of uh, thy vine unpruned. It is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be food for you, for thee, and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, for which the, and so on. Okay. And it goes into some other interesting things, jubilee years and other exciting stuff. Uh, you get down here to verse uh, 20. And if you shall say, What shall we eat in the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow and gather and increase. Then will I command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, that it will bring forth fruit for three years. Why three? Well, because you not only have to carry through the fallow year, but the seed time and harvest of the following. See, in other words, it's thought through. See, And verse 20, And you shall sow in the eighth year, and yet eat of the fruit until the ninth year, uh, and until her fruits shall uh, come in, uh, in, ye shall eat of the old store. The land shall not be sold forever, but the land is mine. Who owns the land in Israel? God, you betcha. For ye are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. This then gets into the law of redemption. The whole idea that the, in Israel, they didn't really sell the land, they leased it. And there's a redemption procedure that is very important. Jeremiah is going to deal with this later in his book. And it's going to give, that insight will be essential if you're going to understand Revelation chapter 5 and the seven sealed book and all of that. We could also from here go to Exodus 23, where the same thing is sort of recounted. We will skip that. Let's, well, why we're so conveniently here, let's turn to Leviticus 26. Now, in Levit Leviticus 26, we have a prophecy. Now, this prophecy in verse 32, it says, I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies who dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the nations and will draw you out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye are in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. And on it goes. Now, where am I headed? Well, we all know that the, Babylon, the King Nebuchadnezzar conquered his, uh, Jerusalem and put them into slavery for 70 years. Why did Nebuchadnezzar have them as slaves 70 years? The answer to that turns out to be in Second Chronicles. Turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles, which is the last chapter of the book of Chronicles, so you can go to Ezra and turn left. Okay. Second Chronicles 36, and we're talking about the captivity of Judah under Babylon. Verse 10 mentions Nebuchadnezzar and so forth, and Zedekiah and all of that. 
And we get through here. We'll pick this up about verse 20. And those who had escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons, until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Persia ultimately displaced Babylon, as you know. Verse 21 is your key verse. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. See, Jeremiah is the authority for the 70 years. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept the Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. You're saying, Chuck, you're kidding. You're trying to tell me that for 490 years, Israel ignored the law of the Sabbath. They kept the Sabbath day and they created all kinds of things, kosher laws, all this other stuff. But they did not keep the Sabbath of the land for 490 years. And the Lord, in effect, says, okay, guys, you owe me 70. Isn't that wild? That's not one of Chuck Muster's crazy hypotheses. It's right here in Second Chronicles 36, 21. An important verse. Now, that turns out to be, the, there are actually four known 490-year period, uh, period, periods in Israel history, but I'll come back to that. Before we do that, I'd like you to turn with me to one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. You all know it well, as students of prophecy, Daniel chapter 9. And you all know the last four verses probably by heart because that's the famous, one of the most famous prophecies in the Scripture, the, fam- the, fab- the fabled 70-week prophecy of the book of Daniel. Daniel 9, 24, 25, 26, and 27. And we won't get into that tonight. If you haven't been through the tapes, I commend them to you. But I'm really after the first part of this chapter, the most interesting part, well, I won't say the most interesting, but a very, very precious part of chapter 9 is Daniel's prayer. Daniel prays, and as he prays, he gets intensely worked up, and that's, you, you can even feel that in the English. You can feel his pulse quicken in the English. But in chapter, Daniel chapter 9, it's the interrupted prayer of the Old Testament. And, of course, this prayer gets interrupted by Gabriel coming with this incredible vision at the end. But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, In the first year of Darius, the son of Asherus, the seed of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, bear in mind now, Daniel's unique in his career, deported as a teenager, put through postgraduate school, lived through the Babylonian period, rose to number two or three. I mean, a heavy dude in the whole operation. They get conquered by the Persians. And Daniel once again ends up being third in the kingdom. He, so his, his career spans two rival empires. A fascinating guy. Very interesting career. Now, it, incidentally, in chapter 9, about 67 of the 70 years have gone by. Daniel's an old man now. He's no longer a teenager. He's an aged, aged guy. Okay, now, and I, 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 don't, I don't get it all. I get, this is one place I got too many notes. I'll try to skip some. Anyway, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years concerning which the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications and with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord. And then he goes on and makes confession on behalf of his people. And as you read that, the verbs, especially when you get down about verse 17, 18, the verbs verbs pick up pace. And he just is almost trembling by the time you, when you read this, even in the English, you'll feel his his pace pick up. And of course, it's in chapter 20 that Gabriel interrupts the, the, the proceedings and gives him this famous famous 70-week prophecy. The point I'm making, though, the reason I bring you here is the 70 years captivity is, a, um, is something that caused Daniel to go into prayer. And I want you to notice something. Daniel took Jeremiah literally. One of the profound lessons you can learn from the Scripture is every place in the Scripture where someone is reading the Scripture, it is The Holy Spirit makes it very clear they took it literally. Here, Daniel didn't figure the 70 years were about a generation or two or some symbolic period. He knew the 70 years were about up, so it was time to get in the prayer closet, deal with this. And uh, he took it literally. Every place in the Scripture, uh, the, the Holy Spirit clearly intends it to be taken literally. The most extreme example is Jesus Christ when he opens his ministry. 
and reads from that passage which we call Isaiah 61, the first two verses. In there, in that rendering by none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, he reads Isaiah and stops at a comma. Doesn't complete the sentence. Sets down and says, this day is that scripture fulfilled in your ears. Thank goodness he stopped at the comma. Because the part that was left is, and the day of vengeance of your God. And that would have ushered in the whole enchilada. And you and I would not be saved. And uh, praise God that he's tarried and allowed us to, to be in the kingdom. Now, something else about Daniel you might enjoy. Um, I have here a clipping that I clipped from the paper some years ago. But the title is from the Los Angeles Herald Examiner. It dates this thing. Is, the Israelis are back to biblical farming. Jerusalem Associated Press. Is, Israeli Jews are once again obeying the biblical law of the Sabbath, sabbatical year during which the farmland must lie fallow. But our, farmers are exploiting a variety of tortuous loopholes to keep their country in fruits and vegetables. Then it quotes Leviticus that we just read. I'll skip that part of it. And indeed, the Jews have ever since set aside the seventh year as the uh, Shunat Shemitah or the sabbatical year. The Shemitah applies primarily to the land that it may not be plowed, no crops may be planted, no fruit and vegetables picked. Sabbatical follows the Jewish lunar calendar, beginning and ending usually in September. Seems like an, an added burden for a country whose struggling economy leans heavily on exports of citrus, flowers, and winter crops. But there's a loophole. The Bible says nothing about land belonging to non-Jews. So every seventh year, all land owned by the government, the agricultural conglomerates, and the small holders is, quote, sold, close quote, to the state rabbinic, uh, by the state rabbinic to a non-Jew, usually a Christian Arab. The buyer whose identity is secret signs a bill of purchase, whereby he theoretically owns the one million acres of farmland during the sabbatical year. Payment is postponed until the sabbatical ends, but by then the buyer is bound to sell the land back to the Jewish owners. He receives a small commission for going along with the elaborate dodge. (laughs) Critics of Israel's union of religion and state call it a farce, but to religious Jews it is a vital process for it enables them to work the land without fear of violating the biblical law. (laughs) Nothing's changed, okay? (laughs) You see the pharisaical mind there, see? So, so uh, uh, you, you, you really have to, you really have to um, understand that, that strange mentality that uh, goes through. And I'm not saying this is widespread anymore. There's obviously people in Israel that are offended by the practice. And, but it's interesting because it shows at least they're giving substance to the letter of the law. Something you might find interesting, by the way, um, and that is this whole business of Seventy weeks. We talk about Daniel's 70 weeks. The 70 years led to the 70-week prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. It's interesting that from Abraham to the Exodus turns out to be 75 years, according to Genesis 12, 4, and Galatians 3, 17, another 430. Or if you add that up, it's 505 years. But uh, under Ishmael, there was 15 years under the usurper. So 15 from the 505 means there's 490 good years in which they're in favor from Abraham to the Exodus. From the Exodus to the temple turns out to be um, 591 plus 10 for the dedication. This is from 1 Kings 6 and 1 Kings 8. But anyway, it's 601 years. But if you study the book of Judges carefully, there are six servitudes. Eight years under Mesopotamia, 18 years under the Moabites, 20 years under the Canaanites, seven years under the Midianites, uh, 18 years under a combination of the Philistines and Ammonites, and then another 40-year servitude under the Philistines. When you add that up under the Judges, there's 111 years of servitude in the, book of the, in the book of Judges. When you subtract the 111 from the 601, you get 490. So it's 490 years from the Exodus to the Temple. Now, from the Temple dedication to the Edict of Artaxerxes, which leads them back, that's the Daniel 70-week thing, First Kings 8... We find uh, we can essentially uh, time that to about 1005 B.C. And then for Nehemiah 2, it's 445 B.C., which is a date familiar to you. That's a total of 560 years. But that includes the Babylonian captivity of 70. So 560 minus 70 is how much? 490. So that's three periods so far. Abraham to the Exodus, the Exodus to the Temple, the Temple uh, dedication to the Edict of Artaxerxes. Three periods of 490 years each, if you don't count those periods in which they're in servitude or in disfavor as a country. From Artaxerxes, Longimanus, unto the second coming of Jesus Christ is 490 years, 70 times 7, the 70-week prophecy of Daniel, 493 plus 7 with a gap between. What's the gap? The diaspora. And, uh, and so it's, time, it's the times of the Gentiles, to be more precise. Kind of interesting. Don't know if it's right. Thought I'd share it with you. Um, 
Before we're through Jeremiah, we'll also talk about the application of a prophecy of Ezekiel and how it might apply to the first and third sieges of Nebuchadnezzar, but we've got some more background to dig up before we go that far in this particular study. Seventy years, the 70 years captivity of uh, Judah in Babylon. Okay, we got to verse 12. It shall come to pass that when the 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. Now, this is also going to show up in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 11 through 13. We'll take it up then. But I think I would like, just so you, to bring this more crisply, and turn to Isaiah 13, the book of Isaiah, chapter 13, where the same prophecy is also mentioned, perhaps a little more, uh, with a little more clarity. Let's turn to Isaiah 13, chapter 13, and we have uh, Isaiah's talking about the coming judgment upon Babylon, which is quite impressive, because he's prophesying much earlier than Jeremiah. And we'll pick it up about verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah are over. We're not even sure where they were. Okay? Babylon will be in the same place. Notice verse 20. It shall never be inhabited. What? Babylon. It shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and ostriches shall dwell there, and he-goats shall dance there. And the wild beasts of the coastland shall shriek in their desolate houses, and jackals in their pleasant palaces, for her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged." Prophecy of Isaiah. So Jeremiah has the same thing several places, but I thought it would be interesting to get a totally different view, namely Isaiah. Now, what makes this really provocative, if you want to visit Babylon, there's some ruins and some archaeological digs. And the Iraqi government has several times attempted to sponsor a project to rebuild Babylon as a tourist attraction to generate trade. And each time they start that, it collapses, doesn't seem to get anywhere, which I think is kind of interesting. There is, I am told, another recent attempt to reconstruct Babylon to draw tourist attraction. I don't know how you're going to draw tourists with that war going on, but anyway, it'll be interesting to watch that. Now, first of all, I was in tr- what little reading I did catch, which was some time ago, I understand they're going to build it nearby, but not at the original site, which I think provocative. I don't know why. Um, but also, I don't think they've built it yet. Maybe I may be out of date. I may be stand corrected on that. But we might watch with this biblical background. It should be very interesting to see what prosperity Iraq has trying to create Babylon as, a, as an inhabited site, because I think they're flying in the face of some pretty heavy odds uh, trying to do that. So they have not read Jeremiah 25 or Isaiah 13 or Jeremiah 50, but we'll keep moving. Now, one thing I might point out, God used Babylon, but he did not use Babylon because of its merits. Babylon didn't merit some special role for God to use it for his purposes, yet he used it for his purposes. And we should all remember that, too, as God uses us. We should be, it's a wonderful blessing to be used to the Lord, and yet at the same time, you must recognize that the Lord has his purposes. They don't imply merit in the vehicle. And uh, the reason Babylon was used by God was because not because of Babylon's merit, but because of Israel's sin. Now, why do I make that point? Well, I guess I'm worried about the United States of America. Because if uh, where Jeremiah points to Shiloh and the northern kingdom in his prophecies, which disappeared 100 years earlier and told that Judah should have learned from that experience, I hear echoes in Jeremiah's words for our ears how we should learn from Judah's experience. We were a nation called by God to to bring the light of Christ to the world. That's what Christopher Columbus' parents had that vision. That's why they named him Christ-bearer, Christopher. And the whole history of the United States, when you study it, say, for example, with the light and the glory, uh, Peter Marshall and David Manuel's book, could give you a whole different perspective of the origins of this country. And to see us now clearly have no pretense to being... Uh, ascribed as a Christian nation, embracing secular humanism and, and worse, 
as a country. Is God going to judge us? I don't know how he cannot. And will he use the same mechanisms that he used with Judah? I don't know. But there he used the enemies of Judah as his instruments. Will God use the enemies of the United States to be his instrument? I don't know. It's a very, very heavy thing to give some prayerful thought to. But we'll keep moving. Verse 13, And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book which Jeremiah had prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall make slaves of them. Now, by he's talking now about the Babylonian slavery of Judah. Many nations and great kings shall make slaves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds, according to the works of their own hands. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink, and be moved, and be mad, because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup at the Lord's hand, and made all the nations to drink, unto whom the Lord had sent me. To wit, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, and its kings and its princes, to make them a desolation, a horror, a hissing, and a curse, as it is this day. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and his servants, and his princes, and all his people, and then all the mixed people, and all the kings of the land of Uz, and the kings of the land of the Philistines, and Ashkelon, and Gaza, and Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, and Edom, and Moab, and the children of Ammon, and all the kings of Tyre, and all the kings of Sidon, and all the kings of the coasts, which are beyond the sea, Dedan, and Tema, and Buz, and all that are in the utmost corners, and all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mixed people that dwell in the desert, the Bedouins, if you will and all the kings of the Zimri, and all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of the Medes, and all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak shall drink after them. Well, a lot going on here. Uh, by the way, these, uh, these verses here are connected by the Septuagint to chapters 46 through 51 of Jeremiah. We're going to get into a lot of this in more t- detail later. Now, you notice, the, you couldn't help but notice the expression here of the cup of his fury. Now, that phrase is not an unfamiliar phrase to you and I. We see it in chapters 49, 51 of Jeremiah, Job 21, Psalm 60, Isaiah 51, Ezekiel 23, Mark 10 and 14, John 18, Revelation 14. That is a very familiar phrase, Revelation 16 and Revelation 18. This cup of his wrath is a common phrase. How many times does it occur in the Bible? 14. Kind of interesting, I think. The cup can also be used as a blessing. We'll find that phrase in Psalm 16 and 23, Luke 22, twice, 1 Corinthians 10 and uh, 1 Corinthians 11. If you count all those up, it's seven times as a blessing. So it's an idiom used broadly, but we're very familiar with this phrase as a cup of wrath or his fury or his indignation, if you will. Now, from that, we then go into this judgment of all these nations. And the same nations are detailed in chapters 46 through 51 of Jeremiah, so we'll be encountering them again. And it starts from the south, goes to the north, from Egypt, if you will, to Persia, basically. The judgment begins with Jerusalem and Judah. Not surprising. Judgment always begins where? In the house of God, you betcha. Now, from verses 19 through 22, we have the Egyptians, uh, who were, themselves were of mixed blood, by the way. Uz, you may recall from Job chapter 1, verse 1, that's uh, north, east or northeast of Edom. Um, the Philistine cities are mentioned there, all but Gath are next. Uh, the remnant of Ashdod you may have caught, uh, that was because it was destroyed after a 29-year siege earlier, and it was rebuilt in Nehemiah's day. And so it's the remnant of Ashdod is, that is mentioned. Edom, uh, Moab, Ammon, uh, these are all blood, blood relations with Israel. Uh, that are mentioned, of course, Tyre and Sidon up in Phoenicia we're familiar with. From verse 23 on, we get to the Arabian tribes. Dedan is a familiar one from Ezekiel 38 and elsewhere. Dedan was a son of Abraham by Keturah, and uh, in Genesis 25, verse 3, he dwelt southeast of Edom. Tema is 250 miles southeast of Edom in Arabia, son of Ishmael in Genesis 24. Also shows up in Job chapter 6, verse 19. Buzz is descended from uh, Nahor, brother of Abraham, in Genesis 22, and generally speaks of the northern Arabian tribes. And then we also had the, uh, uh, the uh, Bedouins of, the, uh, of uh, Arabia there. We also had Cushite, Cushite elements run through here. Zimri is a puzzlement. Uh, we're not sure where Zimri was. Uh, it, he shows up in Numbers 25, 1 Kings 16, 2 Kings 9, 1 Chronicles uh, 
uh, 7, 8, and 9. We're not sure, though, exactly where Zimri is. It's possible it's the same as Zimran, who is a son of Abraham by Keturah in Genesis 24, 2. And if so, he, he apparently dwelt between the Arabian Peninsula and Persia in that general area. Elam and Media are mentioned here. Uh, they are east of the Tigris River. Elam is northeast uh, of the Persian Gulf, about 200 miles east of Babylon. And, of course, Media is north and west of Persia and forms an alliance with the Persians to become the Medo-Persian Empire that subsequently puts down Babylon and in turn is captured by the Greeks, if you're familiar with your ancient history. The Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, and then, of course, the Romans, as is chronicled by Daniel in chapter 2 in advance and in chapter 7, very, very, very dramatically. Um, now we get to something else that might interest you. When we get to verse 26, it's always nice to have profound, important truths, but it's also nice to throw out some trivia. And I'm going to now give you some trivia. All the kings of the north, far and near, one, from another, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak will drink after them. This is one of these peculiar oddities. The word Shishak happens to be an encrypted form of the name Babylon. And that may come as a surprise to you that there are secret codes in the scripture. If you are a student of cryptoanalysis or crypt, uh, cryptographic writing, uh, you would be familiar with, you might encounter, if you do historical studies of that, that there are three kinds of encryptions in the Hebrew that are found in the ancient text. One is called atabash, and it comes from a contraction of the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. By the way, alphabet itself is a Hebrew word for the alphabet, okay? Aleph, Tibet, okay? But the point is, uh, well, you may not realize that in English. There are several words you may not realize. I, I remember when I was in school, the teacher always said, don't say ain't. I don't know why. It's a good Hebrew word. Do you know that? Yeah, it is. It really is. When you say ain't, you're, you're borrowing a Hebrew word. It means exactly what you think it does. But also alphabet happens to be a Hebrew word. Those are, see, even a Gentile background, you pick up some of this stuff. But anyway, uh, there is a way. One of the simplest ways of doing an encryption is to do a transposition of letters. Okay. And one of the ways, if you take the alphabet, if we took the English alphabet with 26 letters, we could fold the Z under the A. We could, we could fold it back so that the Z is under the A and, and, and all the court, other letters correspondingly, okay? So that if you, wherever you use an A, you use a Z. Wherever you use a B, you use a Y. And wherever you use a C, you use a, you know, you'd, you'd do a simple transposition. Now, if you fold it end to end that way, in the English, there's 26 letters. In the Hebrew, there's 22 so if you fold the last 11 back around so that the, the 22nd letter is under the first and so forth, you have a paradigm or a, a, a cipher that is known as atbash. And if you take the Hebrew letters for Babylon, Babel actually, and transposition them, you get Shishak. Now, that occurs in the Bible here in chapter 25, verse 26. It shows up in chapter 51 twice, and also in Isaiah chapter 7. Now, in Isaiah chapter 7, they use a different form. There's another form called Albam, in which you take the 11 and you just slide them over so that the, ele so that the 12th letter comes under the first. In other words, the letters stay in the same order, they're just transposed. That scheme gives you a different set of encryptions. And in Isaiah chapter 7, you can read there about a plot where the uh, northern kingdom was in a conspiracy with some kings. They ended up getting defeated. But it turns out you'll encounter the name Ramalia, and you'll also encounter the name Tabil. And they're the same guy. One's the encrypted version of the other. And all that does is give you an insight as to who would have been in charge had they won the battle. They lost, so it doesn't matter. So you say, well, gee, that sounds great, Chuck. What has it got to do with anything? Not a lot, except, <laughs> except, if you're a student of cryptographic writing, cryptoanalysis, if you're in the intelligence agencies or whatever and you're interested in crypto, crypto, cryptography, it's an interesting historical... Oh, there's a third type of encryption which is uh, in which there's numerical values of the letters and that's you, you don't see it in the scripture to our knowledge but you do see it in the Babylonian Talmud. So these three forms of ancient, relatively simple ciphers are found in the ancient texts. Now, as I say, if you're a student of cryptography then these are just simple interesting historical oddities. If, however, you have 
a mystical view of the scripture. If you believe that the Holy Spirit puts nothing in here, but by his design, then the emergence of these simple ciphers, I believe, could be very significant. Because the Holy Spirit has given us a signpost telling us that there may be more. Maybe more sophisticated, and maybe some of them requiring a spiritual insight, not simply the rigors of mechanical, tra- mechanical translation languages. And if that's true, then maybe we have a totally different uh, possible insights when we get to Revelation thirteen eighteen, the most famous cipher of them all, with a 603 score and 6. That may have nothing to do with anything you've heard before. It may have, but I believe its answer is in the scripture, not in, in uh, the classical geometrical type of analysis. So that's a little excursion that you can mull over. You may ask then, well, wait a minute. Why would Jeremiah bother putting in Babel, the term Babylon in encryption? Here. He's spoken so glibly of them before. Yes, but not derogatorily, and if this passage might have been written when Nebuchadnezzar was at the gates. So he may have used a code name in lieu of the standard. That's speculation we don't know, and I just share that with you as just a side insight. It's just a little uh, minor color on the name Shishak, but it may have a scholastic significance if indeed the Holy Spirit has put it here as a hint of others that may require more sophisticated insights to comprehend. Okay, that gets us down to verse 27. We're moving right along. Therefore, thus shalt thou uh, uh, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink and be drunk, and vomit and fall, and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. There's a good graphic promise for you. (laughs) King James doesn't pull its punches. Verse 28, It shall be that if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink... Then thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall certainly drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And should ye be utterly unpunished? Ye shall not be unpunished, for I will call a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Whoa, we just changed subjects, didn't we? This prophecy is not constrained to the judgment on Babylon later. It is... Uh, not the judgment of just um, the invasion of Jerusalem under Nebuchadnezzar, etc. The scope of this prophecy, as so often happens, goes far beyond the immediate horizon of the prophet. We see that in Daniel chapter 11, from verse 36 and 40. The, the gears just shift. Uh, in, Revel- in uh, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, all these places, we'll see one thing being addressed, but the language very clearly shifts gears and broadens its real subject to something quite uh, much more, uh, much broader. So, uh, okay, so I, I will call up a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. And Zechariah tells us, where does he gather them together, all nations, to battle against whom? Jerusalem. I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. I'll bring all nations against Jerusalem. There's not a battle of Armageddon. That's the staging area. Armageddon is to, the, is to the gathering against Jerusalem what England was to the Normandy invasion. It's the gather, I will gather them together in a place which is called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Stage it for what? To go against Jerusalem. That day is coming. Verse 30, Therefore prophesy against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, like a lion, huh? And utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout like those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Who? A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give those who are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day. From one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth, they shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be refuse upon the ground. Wail, ye shepherds, and cry. 
Wallow in the ashes, ye chief of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished, and ye shall fall like a pleasant vessel. And the shepherds shall have no way to flee, nor the chief of the flock to escape. A voice of the cry of the shepherds and a wailing of the chief of the flock shall be heard. For the Lord hath spoiled their pasture. And the peaceable habitations are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He hath forsaken his covert like a lion. For the land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor. And also because of his fierce anger. Whoa. Did Jeremiah shift gears on us? Did he throw us a curve? You betcha. There's much more here than was literally dealt with in in, uh, Judea when Nebuchadnezzar dealt. And a much, much broader sense of language. Now, this idea of the treading of the grapes and so forth um, that we found there in verses um, uh, back there in in, uh, the middle of that. Um, Isaiah 63 describes that same thing. Revelation chapter 14, verses 19 through 20, describes the same thing. Revelation chapter 19 describes him. Both uh, Isaiah 63 and Revelation 19 describes the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in which he has a vesture dipped in what? Blood. His blood? No, his blood was shed at Calvary. What blood is splattered on his garments? Blood of his enemies. The blood of his enemies. Strange. You know, you and I have a tough time with that because that's not the the Sunday school Jesus that we are so comfortable with that's pictured in the little storybooks, you know, uh, being the gentle, meek servant of the Lord in, as, as we see him depicted in his, in his earthly ministry. This is a, a powerful commander coming to take possession of that which he purchased and dispossessing the land of its usurpers. This is what we see um, graphically portrayed throughout the Old Testament prophecies, and yet those same idioms are climaxed in a book that completes the New Testament, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation seems strange to your ears only because it speaks in the Old Testament idioms. The, old, the, the book of Revelation is structurally modeled by the book of Joshua well in advance, but they, they fit structurally uh, identically. A couple other small points in verse 30 there. We notice the Lord shall roar from on high. Who goes around the world like a roaring lion, seeking whom he, whom he may devour? Satan. Familiar phrase from the New Testament. Did you realize that that phrase is Satan attempting to be a counterfeit? Who goes about like a roaring lion? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Thus described several times in the Old Testament that way. So when you hear... Paul talking about Satan going around like a roaring lion. Uh, Yes, he is, and I'm not here to disparage his efforts because uh, Jude tells us that we should not speak evil of dignities and uses Satan as the very example. At the same time, even in that, he's a counterfeit. Even in that, he's um, an imitation. And of course, you can find that uh, all through uh, Amos and Joel and Isaiah and Revelation 10 and so on. I think you've been spared jumping prematurely into chapter 26. So we'll take that up next time. When we get into chapter 26, it is really the results of what we read in chapter 7. If you may recall, when we were in Jeremiah chapter 7, the first 20 verses dealt with what we call the temple address. Jeremiah situated himself in the outer court on a feast day when there's lots of crowds and gave an address. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about that. And that address is summarized in just a few verses in chapter 26. But then what happens is that so incensed his enemies that he's tried for heresy. And the ecclesiastical court wants to hang him. But the civil court comes to his rescue. Very strange inversion. The layman, in effect, in in an ecclesiastical sense, uh, save him. And uh, he, is, he is acquitted, if you will. Even though he made no defense of himself, he didn't care. That's their problem. Um, and uh, we'll, that's what we'll be dealing with with uh, chapter 26 next time. The, the, the whole uh, business of, um, 
of uh, Jeremiah and being tried for heresy and, um, you know, more of the more of these issues that uh, he hits head on. Now, more and more, you're going to discover as we go that buried in in uh, Jeremiah, it's almost as if the idioms pick up. We're going to find more and more little nuggets that relate to uh, the subject matter you and I are perhaps more directly interested in. Uh, we're going to discover the very idioms of the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, and so forth, uh, described in here. And uh, uh, we're going to find, in fact, the whole thing is going to uh, get more and more uh, graphic, more and more relevant for you and I in, in, a, in, a, in a more classical, prophetical sense. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Amazing guy, Jeremiah. God gave him incredible visibility far beyond his immediate ministry, the ministry to Judah. And, and, and the coming captivity of Nebuchadnezzar. His book has all kinds of details that affect you and I today, right now, as we read our daily paper. We're going to see increasingly evidence that God has pre-written the time you and I live in. He has uh, declared what He is going to do. We, you and I are heading into a climactic period of world history. And Jeremiah, as all the Old Testament prophets uh, do, have a great deal to say about that, and we're going to increasingly focus on that. But what does that mean? It's, it's fun to dig into some of these stuff, and it's also all, always gratifying to see how the Word of God interprets itself and, and illuminates one piece, illuminates another, and we learn from that and we grow. That's great. But what does it mean for you and I? You and I have to come to grips with the fact that God took the trouble to specifically describe the time of history that you and I are moving into because Israel is no longer dispersed. She's regathered in the land. Jerusalem is no longer trodden down by the Gentiles. If you visit Jerusalem today, it flies into the Star of David for the first time since Christ, the week that he was crucified. He predicted that it would be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That peculiar biblical period that God set out from the days of Nebuchadnezzar till now are about over. What does that mean for you and I? A lot of things. It means we better do our homework. It's time to really re-examine what Jesus Christ was all about, who he said he was, what he was about to do, what he expects of us, what he is, what what uh, what promises he's made us, and those things should affect our moment by moment commitment to him. Jesus Christ does not simply want to be the most important thing in your life. For many of us, that's a big step, but that's not enough. He wants to be your whole life. Jesus Christ wants to be your Lord, not just your Savior. Let's bow our hearts.